Hello and welcome to Child Care in Iowa. Um, my name is Melissa Jewell and I'm the Regional Director for Northwest Iowa. Um, I am putting together this video just to kind of give a quick overview as to what's going on with child care in Iowa right now, specifically in Northwest Iowa. Child care since um, this COVID-19 pandemic has started has been a in flux and at the beginning of time in March and April, it seemed like child care was changing daily. It's starting to slow down a little bit, but as I'm um, recording this on May 20th, we know that um, the Department of Human Services is about to come out with some new guidances on uh, openings and specifically on child care again, hopefully by the end of this week. So it is an ongoing story and we will try to keep everybody uh, up to date as possible, but a lot's happened in the last couple months, so I wanted to at least get you up to date as far as we are today at this time that I'm making this recording. So as we've been going on, um, what we started back in April, once this all kind of started happening, the Department of Human Services and Child Care Resource Reform worked together to release a survey to child care providers. It ran from April 10th to the 17th. We really wanted to see what the impact of was happening to child care providers. Were they open? Were they closed? What was financial impact? What resources did they need? There are a ton of community partners across Iowa who also were asking the same type of questions and wanted the information. So we wanted to do the survey and make sure that um, we could share the information with everybody. So some of the things that we learned from that survey, we received 1,983 back. At least one survey was from each of the 99 counties. 42% that responded were center-based child care preschool and 58% worked from home. I think that what we were pleasantly surprised at the time was 76% reported that they, the facility was still open and only 24% of them reported that they were closed. Uh, also, what we found with a lot of those closed ones at that time, too, were a lot of school-based before and after school programs um, that when the schools closed quickly, they also closed at the same time. So um, that we, we take that as good information that 76 was still open at that time. So out of the responses that said that they were open, 51% reported still having openings to accept child care. Most of those were temporary openings that they said until the regular families could come to work. So in a two week period, what we saw happen with child care is that um, families were sent home, high school, college kids were all of a sudden home. So instead of, I think what our, everybody thought might happen is that the families that went to work, if child care closed, that there'd be no place for children. Instead, more children went to friends, family and neighbor care or stayed home with their parents who are now working from home, which really gave us uh, a lot of openings in childcare. And what we've been hearing actually is that the centers that are open are operating at much smaller capacity and they are having a struggle financially um, and then also keeping their staff um, full-time employed. So, but that is, what happened that we we and I think we have over 10,000 openings across the state right now reported in child care so that there still is places for families if they do need to go to work um, for them to go at this time. From the ones that opened 69% reported experienced financial loss and an additional 20% said not yet but I expect you. So remember we're asking this question um, about a month and hardly even a month in so of the providers experiencing financial loss, 61% of them reported zero to 5,000, 16% reported a loss of 5,000 to 10,000. There were a couple that were in the 40 to $50,000 ranges. So what we're seeing here is, first off, it's an initial loss. I don't think the we're going to do another survey here. We're getting that prepared to run. And I think we're going to see that financial loss a lot larger as we go forward, um, but some of the larger centers is what's reporting the larger loss, obviously. 
fundamentally lost space. So these were the survey response from closed facilities. And again, 82% of network closed, I kind of mentioned this a little early, they were K2 school closures or families keeping children at home for other reasons. We had some home child care providers needing to close because they or their families were at health risk. So um, they all had valid reasons why they closed, but that's kind of um, where the responses landed at. From the closed facilities, 39% um, reported a loss of zero to $5,000, 18% a loss of 5,000 to 10,000, and 13% said loss of 10 to 20,000, which makes sense since they're completely closed that they would have a larger loss at that time. Um, when asked if they were going to reopen, I think this is another positive thing, 87.5% said yes, they were going to um, open up again. 12% reported they were unsure at this time. So we really need to be able to work with that 12% on what will the plans be and what supports do they need to definitely reopen? So the next section I wanna talk a little bit about um, is kind of how we've been trying to support COVID-19 in our Northwest County area. Again, we cover 23 areas, uh, 23 counties in our area, and we are daily getting a list of do we get any additional report, closing reports? We're getting vacancy information. Um, the governor asked all child care providers to daily update us on their vacancies or their status. So our consultants are doing extra calling, the providers are calling us if, as needed. So we're really trying to make sure that we have a definite handle on where we're at with um, access to child care, also to know what our child care providers need um, to get through this pandemic. So if you look at our data, specifically just for our 23 counties, 69% are reporting that they're still open and 31 are reporting that they're closed. So we're a little higher on the closed rate than the state average, but we're still kind of around in that area. Um, one thing, I think the next part of the slide will show is we've been really trying to be responsive um, to both those that are opened and closed. Our child care consultants are trying to get in, be in communication again with them as often as possible. You will notice um, our technical assistance visits from January to April, how they have jumped. So January and February is probably our normal technical assistance. So these are telephone calls and email supports not just calling them, but really doing more consultation on a phone. You'll see in March and April how much those have jumped. Also for the end of April, um, beginning of May, definitely the beginning of May, we also were approved to do virtual site visits. So our data going forward will also show how we are trying to use technology to do virtual visit, visits. And in those virtual visits where we're face-to-face -face doing that type of consultation, we're really trying to be able to help them to keep moving forward. Like, how can we help you fill out the forms for DHS? And we'll get into that a little bit more about some stipend payments. How do we keep you on track for participating in the quality rating system or child net or other quality initiatives? And while some people think, why would they touch that at this point, um, especially for those businesses that might be closed or because they have lower numbers, the directors or the business owners are finding they actually have some time that maybe they could do some of these other things too. So we just want, we're not asking them to do that. We're not pushing them to do that, but we want to be available that if they want to use this maybe less downtime than normal to work on some of these things, our staff are available to help them um, in a way that we can. So other things that we've done is we have gone back to our uh, local ECI areas. There are seven total early child early childhood Iowa area boards in our area. Five of them have uh, the business investment program through us. We did request for the people that have not already claimed in the business investment program this year, if we could add additional things that would help them pay 
um, and have cash flow during this pandemic. So these are examples of things that we added as allowable costs and we got board approval on those. Um, recently, we have another board that's offered more money into that program. Um, so we'll keep responding and trying to get um, help through the business investment program as much as possible. Um, and you'll see on the other side, so far to date, we have uh, allocated 28,350 specifically helping people with COVID-19 above and beyond what's um, normally acceptable in a business investment program. And like I said, we have another board that's approved another $10,000. So we'll keep track of that by the end of the fiscal year. We will report a total dollar amount that we use through the business investment program to help um, address COVID-19 also. All right, another thing we did to step up services and be as supportive as possible. Um, the past two years, we have offered peer-to-peer -peer meetings. We have moved those peer-to-peer -peer meetings to on an online training platform, meaning we want to get them together and give them a space where they can talk about what's going on in their business, learn from each other, hopefully mentor from each other, and just provide that networking that this, um, really can be an isolating career. And so we wanna be able to make them have connections and get that support as much as possible. So it's been kind of exciting to watch it instead of being like a local um, meeting that we're going online. And in fact, you'll see some things move not only into options just to our region, we've opened it up statewide and we're really being able to get people better connected um, during this time. So in those peer-to-peer -peer meetings, uh, two meetings I think really stand out. One meeting, we actually hired Tom Copeland to be part of the peer-to-peer -peer meeting. So they could sit down, well, virtually sit down, and ask him uh, questions about finance and procedures. Tom Copeland is a lawyer from Minnesota. He specializes in child care information. He releases his email and he lets people ask financial questions that he gives them free advice and answers them. So he is an excellent resource. So we were lucky enough to get him to come in and provide that information. And again, we opened that up statewide because it is such a valuable resource. And then we've also brought in the Iowa Department of Public Health to review health and safety guidances with our um, staff. So Heidi Hotfett is in charge of the whole Healthy Child Care Iowa program. And so to bring her in and have them be able to ask her questions is really helpful. Another initiative we've been offering in the last couple months is we call it Operation Drop and Dash. So we've been partnering with the Department of Human Services to distribute supplies locally. Sometimes the Department of Human Services, sometimes one of our regions or just us directly try to access some of these supplies that are hard to find locally. And we've been working together as a state to try to make sure that each of the five regions has access to these things. And then our staff has been doing drop and dashes as child care providers need them. So some of the things we've been doing is thermometers, hand sanitizers, bleach, and paper products. Um, so those are kind of um, calming down a little bit. Now what we're seeing and we're moving into is gloves and um, Obviously, the disinfectant wipes is still popular. Um, we still, no one's had luck getting access to those yet. Um, and then also masks. So we're in the process of getting masks and um, gloves. As soon as we can get those delivered to us, we will start um, getting them out to providers too. Um, but again, it's trying to get that demand um, met and get the supplies here. But as soon as we do, we'll get them out to people. We've also had to address training. Um, most of our uh, spring trainings have been canceled that were scheduled face-to-face. -face. We had several conferences. Uh, Dawn Batker, our new training specialist, was very successful in getting a lot of our conferences actually moved to online training platforms. We also were able to then look for different um, tr online training vendors, and we brought in a lot of different topics and we're offering those online. Um, for example, how to deal with children throughout a crisis and things like that. So we're really trying to 
um, while we can't offer our traditional trainings, we're trying to find other sources and figure out what we can do to offer those to child care providers. The next section we're going to talk about here is really the Department of Human Services um, supports. And these are kind of rolled out in a linear uh, aspect as to how, how and what they did throughout this uh, process. So the first thing they were doing is they partnered with the Department of Corrections and Cedar Ridge Winery and Distillery and purchased hand sanitizers and disinfectants. Um, they used the National Guard to distribute the supplies um, to the five regions. Uh, and that was kind of nice and exciting. And so they're really trying to find their resources that they have available and to get things up to us also. Then March 9th, they did allow providers to bill for unlimited apps days for the child care assistance program for children. And this was a really big help for the child care providers. So um, instead of having um, just a couple days that a child care could bill for absences, um, this allows them to keep their cash flow moving a little bit more as families are making personal choices on what to do with their children. Um, then they also extended the quality rating system and the child net certification to end on July 31st, 2020. So what this does is that child care providers don't need to worry about getting all their training in or their application in, and they're going to lose their quality rating system rating because the ratings now can affect their child care assistance payments. The higher their QRS rating, the higher child care assistance Pay is. So we don't want to lose pay when it's not really the fault that we can't get their applications in and, and meet all those requirements. They also then wrote policies to ease the regulatory requirements, such as federal fingerprinting and CPR certification. Again, this is an access issue. People that normally do fingerprinting, like CCR, are not going out doing fingerprinting. Um, some law enforcement were not allowing that. Um, a lot of people that do the CPR and first aid certification are busy fighting COVID. They're not holding CPR classes, so um, they did not want to hold that against them. So we'll get back to normal, but for this time period, um, they have eased some of those regulations. Then we received federal money through the CARES Act. So it was $3.5 billion was released in discretionary funding designation. On April 14th, I received this allocation right under $32 million. So around this April 14th time is the same time that we were running the child care survey, trying to get that information that we've already covered in this presentation. So they took the information that we um, gleaned from the survey of what child care providers were needing and experiencing and made a plan on how to use um, this $32 million. So on May 5th, they um, released this plan of what they did to do with this. So the first thing that they included is rejuvenation grants. This is for licensed and registered child care programs. So if they were a licensed or registered program by March 1st, 2020, and they are closed for any reason, they can apply to get a rejuvenation grant one just um, it comes in two parts. One is for just to reopen and that starting funds to get reopened. And there's also some money in there designated for cleaning supplies. This money does not um, pertain to non-registered child care homes accepting child care assistance. Again, they're focusing on the programs that are licensed and registered. The next program that they're offering is a basic monthly stipend. So this, in this case, the child care program has to be open in the month that they are applying for the stipend. And so if they were closed and they got a rejuvenation grant, but they opened in, in that same month, they might they can actually qualify for both. And that's a benefit. And that's great. Um, the third stipend then is an essential employee monthly stipend add on if they care for children of essential employees and the definition of essential employees is what the governor claims is, is essential it's on the governor's website and it's on the dhs website but they um, acknowledge that they need to give they don't need to 
if they give essential employees a 25% discount, then they can apply for this essential employee stipend. It's $2,000 for a center and I believe $500 for a home. So in some cases, it's a great financial benefit. In other cases where some of these larger centers have a lot of essential employees, it doesn't cover the 25% um, discount. So really, businesses, child care businesses need to look at their finances and figure out what makes sense for them. So it is possible, though, that in one month, um, a child care business could get all three um, in the same month. Each of those three programs, there is the application process is really filling out a survey. And at the survey, end of the survey, I'll tell them if they qualify for the grants or not. Um, so, but they also need to apply every month. So um, to get the May um, funding, they would have to apply before the end of May. 31st, and then they'd have to go back in in June and apply for the June funding. This money um, today is it is available paying through April through July at this point. DHS will uh, reflect on that later um, and see what needs to happen. But for right now, that is the span of, of this all five actually of these programs that are on the screen right now. The next two programs. Um, are really associated with child care assistance and helping with that um, aspect. So again, we mentioned earlier, DHS had already approved um, unlimited child care assistance absences. And again, this then qualifies if you're a licensed child care, registered child care, or a non-registered home accepting child care assistance. And then the other thing that they added was reimbursing families for their co-payments. So if a family um, is on child care assistance, but they have to pay an additional $20 a week, they no longer have to pay the child care provider the $20 a week. Instead, the Department of Human Services will pay the child care program directly. There are a few more rules and regulations around all of these programs as it pertains to child care providers. Information about them are on our CCR on our website and the Department of Human Services website. Um, but this at least is a quick overview of what is available for child care providers. So we're getting close to the end. Thank you for sticking with me. So what are our next steps for child care? So right now we've got about 239 programs that may need assistance to reopen. What are we going to do in the future? How are we going to be able to help them uh, reopen? Uh, if they're not able to reopen, um, how are we going to handle that? One of the things I think is interesting about this whole process is all of those people that are now taking care of friend, family, and neighbor care, some of those children at home, how can we reach those people and maybe see if they're interested in opening up a child care business? I think that's going to be a chance to identify who it is, but excuse me, I do think we need to try to address that um, as soon as possible. And is there any additional other supports that Early Child Iowa can assist with? I know Iowa, Early Childhood Iowa boys across the Iowa, or Early Childhood Iowa boards across Iowa have been thinking about different ideas so you know how can we figure out what are good ideas across the state and can we try to incorporate them in other ways too so what other considerations um, are we going to be able to do and i think we need to then go back and look at our community supports every community is different so everything every community we have to look at individually so how can we share financial resources for child carers? How um, we're supposed to be reviewing a CDC guidance for reopening. Um, I have some mixed information about if the CDC is coming out with guidance. I know yesterday the governor announced that they're coming out with something that's reopening. Whatever we're going to, whatever guidance we get for reopening, we'll have to look at those are and figure out what kind of supports we can help childcare providers with based on um, those recommendations. Um, 
Child Care Resource and Referral and the Iowa Women's Foundation is partnering up and we're trying to stabilization teams. So we're going to have to identify what centers or homes need help with the stabilization team. And then we're going to need community partners to help us. So if, uh, you know, maybe we're going to need lawyers or accountants or bankers or somebody, um, HR directors, how are we going to help these centers? make sure that they are financially stable again and have the workforce that they need to. So can we put together community stabilization teams? Um, so if you're interested in something like that, please let us know. Well, uh, we need to keep communicating with the, uh, all of our communities and businesses about how important high quality childcare is for the workforce. How can we keep pushing that message forward? How are we going to do to continue recruiting new child care providers and um, center staff? That's really, you know, before we were challenged because the unemployment rate was so low. Now we have a huge high unemployment rate. What is that going to do? Um, do you have some potential to have people consider child care as a new career? We were just, the next thing is promoting child care ready. This is a program that we were just starting to get launched. We work closely with a lot of statewide community partners, including iWorks, um, really trying to get people in the child care ready. Right now, iWorks is overwhelmed, and they're saying they're going to have to stall child care ready at this point. But I think we need to be um, looking at very closely being once things um, are opened up a little bit more how do we access that and make sure that we maximize that and maybe use that as a avenue to help with our child care solutions so as you can see we have a lot of things going on um, and again we're not out of this yet there will continue to be changes i'm sure for child providers along the lines of guidances and resources and I think we're having this conversation when people, when this first started, people were assuming that there was going to not be access to childcare throughout this because so many were closed. So I think we've shown that Iowa and childcare is resilient on that aspect. But now what a lot of us are concerned about is the childcare market was very tough before this started. So really, depending on how fast the economy picks back up, we'll probably see families having a harder time finding childcare when they go back to work than when this pandemic started. So <clears throat> we really need to make sure that we are online with that and be aware of that and how can we address it. Um, if you have any questions, please get a hold of me. Um, my email is on there. Thank you for listening and please be healthy and safe, everybody. Thank you.